Hi, and welcome to Dr. Diego and Debbie. I'm Debbie Goodman, and this is Dr. Iende. And, you know, we have touched on the subject of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy before, but let's talk a little bit about male hormones. We, we tend to think about female hormones when we talk about bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So, in all fairness, let's touch on male hormones. All right, so let's talk about male hormones. Well, um, as you know, all my consultations are, uh, you know, the patient presents himself with symptom complaints, and depending on what those symptom complaints are, uh, we do an assessment. And that workup is usually, you know, a physical exam and blood work and see if there's corroboration and a connection with what we've seen and what's going on with the patient. At the same time, um, when we do uh, hormones, we're talking about a lot, a lot of different hormones, and so it is really based upon the patient presenting with symptoms. At the same time, a lot of my patients come out because they're referred to me um, by referral from family member, their spouse, or they just been reading and they have questions and they look me up online and find out uh, that I do assessments for this type of conditions or these conditions, and then they come and make an appointment to be seen. And so when usually a male presents, well, a male can present if we're talking about hormones, we're talking about all of them. So. It's not just one hormone. I I think know. People, if people, you ask the average person, what's a male hormone? Testosterone. And that's all they know. Yeah, and, and, and that's not the case. It, when we talk about uh, female and male, um, at least genetic uh, distinguishing features uh, in terms of uh, X and Y chromosomes, we, um, we still make the same hormones just in different quantities. And those different quantities of hormones play a huge role evolutionary and um, our embryogenesis in terms of how we develop and usually our, uh, our preferences, okay? And so what we do is we ask questions again and then we do the assessment of workup. So my blood workup will probably be very similar to what it would be for a female okay. because I'm looking at a distribution of hormone balance. And so I'm looking at norms, but I'm also listening to my patient's complaints. So if my patient's complaining about fatigue and low energy, increase uh, centripetal obesity, um, inability to burn fat, inability to keep muscle mass, frailty, weakness, uh, bone density, um, mineralization decreasing, uh, maybe they're a little depressed, maybe they feel anxious, maybe they're just grumpy and just not into doing anything, because that's all a very common complaint when I get uh, older men. Yeah, so, uh, and it could just be somebody who just doesn't feel like doing anything. The whole part about sexual libido thing, that's probably like maybe number five or six on the complaint list. And the idea is that most people tend to think that it's always about that, but it, they may not present with that because that only shows up in 50% roughly of the complaints for males suffering from some type of hormone deficiency. And when we say some type of hormone deficiency, I'm talking about androgens like testosterone and dihydroepiandrosterone because these are the androgenic hormones that we think about in males. But there's a whole lot of hormones. There's things like pregnenolone, there's a dihydroepiandrosterone, there's testosterone, there's estrogens, maybe to a certain extent some progesterone in men, there's growth hormone, and that's just part of the stereogenic pathway that includes the cholesterol pathways. Then we're still talking about the polypeptide, polypeptide hormones like thyroid hormones and growth hormones. So these are other things that we're looking in. When I do an assessment, I'm looking for what the symphony looks like. What's it all look like? Because there's a balance that exists between all the hormones in play. And if one's off, it can tilt that symphony a little bit. It just doesn't sound right. It's like, it's okay, but it's like not as good as it can be. And usually patients will tell you that. They'll tell you, you know, I just don't feel right. The question is, making them define what that means. I, this is what my symptoms complaint is like, okay. So I get I'm developing the idea in my head. And I'm thinking, okay, well, let's do the full workup and let's see what we have. And in that process, again, we're gonna look at nutrition, we're gonna look at organ function, make sure there's not underlying other pathology or some other issue mm -hmm. going on that maybe this is the cause of what's going on. Yeah. So we do try to exclude other organic disease, things like mm -hmm. diabetes, or maybe somebody presents with liver dysfunction. So maybe they're fatigued entirely the time because they have some condition like hemochromatosis or some type of hepatitis or some type of synthetic disease of the liver. So you have to think of all these things when you do a workup. And so it's, you know, our, our differentials are very wide, but you know, you're looking for key questions, and some of those key questions take you down a certain uh, lily pad pathway. So you're walking down the lily pad, uh, developing your your picture. You paint me a picture. You know, so I teach uh, nurse practitioner students, and I'm, I'm a, and I teach for other um, 
uh, medical programs. And so what I do is, when I tell my students, I tell them, hey, listen, if you're going to present to me a patient, it's always about, it's all, 90% of everything you're going to do is going to be the history, probably more than that. The rest is in the physicals. The physical is going to corroborate your history. So get me a good history, okay? Mm -hmm. And remember, uh, the physical should match up with what the history looks like. And so it's all in that. And so when you get that information, you want them to paint you a picture of your patient. So if I come out and I presented you a patient, you'd kind of like get this idea what this person looks like and how they present. So are you profiling? Yeah, to an extent we're profiling because I'm giving you a premium picture profile for you what this patient presents like so I know what I'm looking for. So, and in that regard, we do our workup and we see our deficits and we figure out what we're gonna replace. And, and if it's hormones, then we're gonna replace whatever hormones are, you're deficient in. And so that may be pregnenolone for memory and, um, uh, and preserving brain function. That may be thyroid for the same thing and metabolism. That may be testosterone because of hypogonadism or uh, decreased libido or, or a combination thereof, decreased muscle mass, all that stuff. So we may do that. And if we do testosterone, I always give patients dihydroepiandrosterone because it's higher on the stereogenic pathway and you start to get a feedback deprivation of that over time. So I give pregnenolone because it's higher on the pathway also and I give DHEA dihydroepiandrosterone, and then we give testosterone, and then anything else we may need to. It's very rare that I have to give men estrogen who are just looking for replacement therapy. Sometimes men make too much estrogen, and it may be causing some of the symptom complaints they may present with. So I, I try to manage those based upon their complaints. Some patients have problems with sleeping, a lot of acne, and so you give, the, you give male patients progesterone hmm. to help manage those things, and it seems to do a really good job. You know, and that, that those are the things that can be, those are things that are different levels normally found between men and women, okay? The other things that we look at, things like thyroid and growth hormones, those can be pretty much compatible. It just depends, you know, what age and life they are and determining what the levels would be. But you always want to be at the highest quartile. People say, what's the highest quartile, doc? The highest quartile is that the level at which you see the least amount of disease, aging-specific disease, hmm. degenerative disease, dementia, frailty syndrome, those things, heart disease, because these things are diseases of aging. It, no matter how you want to sum it up, people can eat crummy their whole lives, okay? But when they were 18, 20 years old and they were eating crummy, they didn't have much heart disease. But by the time they get to 50, they got heart disease. So my whole point is it's a, it's a condition of aging because they've done it for 30 years and so their body is aged. But then again, you're going to see it in their skin, see it in their face, see it in their hair. The more unhealthy foods you eat and the more quality of lifestyle that are not healthy for you, you're going to wear it on your skin, your face, your body, <laughs> both internally and externally. So I tell these young people when I see them eating french fries and cheeseburgers and a milkshake, I say, enjoy it while you're young. <laughs> yeah, but every once in a while we sneak one of those in too, because you got to hey. live. You got to live. Yeah. So I do tell most people, eat clean every day of the week you can. If you have a couple meals on the weekend, you just need to go whatever you want to go. You got to live a little bit. You know? Absolutely. You gotta, yeah. you gotta enjoy life. And if it makes a difference in your life, then you should enjoy it. I see. You went to In and Out over the weekend. Yes. <laughs> <Shoot>. <laughs> Didn't have a choice. Pandemic can't stop to eat anywhere. It was in the Bay Area. So you had it. We had to just whatever was available. That was the only thing available. Well, somebody was happy he got a little hat. <laughs> yeah, he didn't like that hat. <laughs> he didn't? He, it was only, he had to fake the happiness. My son had to fake the happiness for my wife to talk into, and then he ripped it off and threw a fit in the, um, in the, in the restaurant. As we oh, I wish food. you would have gotten a video yeah, of that. <laughs> yeah, he threw a fit, and because uh, he, he'll play along for like about 20 seconds, and then he's had it, because he didn't want to wear it. <laughs> uh, I love the chicken costume he that's cute, right? Yeah. He doesn't like that, does he? He again. He played along. He made my my, my wife happy, and then he soon he could take it away. He flipped out and threw it off. And, you know, he's twenty seven months, so he was always oh, terrible too. Yeah, this started about eight months ago. So it's been going on since like you know before eighteen months. So I mean, you know, the little guy's uh, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, he cracks me up. Okay, um, but back to male hormones now. Are there females that can maybe have a little overabundance of testosterone and be like more aggressive? Can we attribute, what can we attribute female aggressiveness to? Is it hormones? Well, I can't probably, I can't speak to that entirely, that being hormones, because there's other things involved, right? Upbringing, stressors, conditioning life. And so there's the environmental factors that shape us as humans too. 
But having said that, if we exclude that, uh, could hormones play a role in aggressive behaviors? Uh, for sure, but maybe it's kind of moodiness and anger and things like that. Maybe aggressive behavior is another, probably another level. If there were astronomical levels or like super physiological, super physiological levels of certain hormones, maybe they could. Um, and maybe in some cases, yeah, yes, women, um, traditionally women have ovaries and we define women as having ovaries because uh, that's the sexual organs along with um, a uterus, okay? And because they have them, they ovulate and they have ovum and the ovum make hormones and those hormones usually typically are estrogen and progesterone to help support a pregnancy if one occurs, okay? So every month a, a woman or a female will cycle through that and then she, she, when she doesn't get pregnant, if she doesn't, then she'll have a cycle and have a menstrual cycle, which is, that's how it works. So in some cases, some women will suffer from conditions such as polycystic ovary syndrome or other conditions in which they make an overabundance of certain types of hormones. Usually they're estrogen dominant they have some uh, remnants of some um, of, uh, embryogenic uh, cells inside the uh, ovaries that will make uh, luteal remnants, and so they'll make a lot more testosterone or DHEA, dihydroendosterone, which can be androgenic, and so, well, they are androgenic, so they can be masculinizing. So you can have usually an elevated level of dihydroendosterone, testosterone as well. You can see some hirsute type of changes like facial hair and body hair, like darkening at a young age, even mustaches and beards sometimes. You can see um, some type of uh, sexual uh, organ um, features changes too, like a clitoral megaly. You can see um, an elevation in sugar levels and insulin resistance, and right. that's typically how we define a polycystic ovary syndrome. Those that they have luteal remnant cells in the ovaries and they're making excess androgens. So in some cases, yes, they can have but it, could I tell you that's why they're aggressive? No. I mean, I'm telling you that, you know, and we get these patients in the office too to come in that may have, because uh, they're anovulatory, so, so they won't ovulate, and they won't hardly ever have cycles, and they have difficulty, or they can't get pregnant. So we usually, when I see a female come in, she's complaining of that, and typically they're a little overweight too, because again, they're pre-diabetic. If they're not diabetic, they're hyperinsulinemic. So they have these conditions that go along with having those hormone dysfunctions. It usually makes them heavy, because hyperestrogenism also makes them have more body mass or body fat. So they're gonna have a lot of these features along with having higher androgens and high estrogen, low progesterone, um, irregular to infrequent or no cycles at all. There are some genetic conditions, you know, that also exist. Uh, but I, I just think that attributing somebody's aggressive behavior um, to just testosterone levels is not uh, an appropriate or adequate uh, definition. Okay. Um, if somebody is using some type of androgens in addition to testosterone, um, where would make them have super physiologic levels of androgens, then understand, remember, hormones are chemical messengers, they're neurochemical messengers, so they help you infer information in your brain of what you're seeing, how, what you're, how you're reacting to it. And so imagine this overabundance amount of androgen, this masculinizing hormone that's affecting how you infer information, how you react to it. In that case, that could be obviously could be a little dangerous. And so, um, so, but that is not what we typically see in somebody who is uh, under regular hormone replacement therapy or something like testosterone replacement therapy, even in women um, or female patients. And the reason why is because we're only replacing to a high normal those levels which you would have had when you were like around 18, 20, mm -hmm. when you were peaking, because that was when you were at your healthiest more than likely. Mm -hmm. And your body was peaking in terms of its ability to metabolize and create energy and f appropriately function. And so we want to try to replicate that with our hormones, our nutrition, our lifestyle. As we age, we need, actually need probably a little more sleep than we used to. We always say, well, I need less sleep. It's probably not less sleep. We probably need a little more sleep because mental deterioration or dementia, and it really uh, gets affected by people, by patients' lack of sleep. All of our abilities to get adequate sleep really plays a huge role on how fast our brains age. And so we typically recommend about six or seven and a half hours of sleep to get adequate recovery without the use of sleep aids at all, unless it's something like melatonin or 5-hydroxytryptophan. And people ask me, well, why? It's real, it's real simple. Your brain recovers during stage three, four, which is slow wave sleep and REM sleep. So if you're taking a sedative, you get stuck in stage one and two of sleep, which means you have to take 
have to have a significant amount of more sleep time to make up for that recovery sleep. And most people don't get recovery sleep. And um, if they're taking any type of sedative hypnotics and it starts to affect their memory, and it starts to affect their function, including all aspects of our life, including sexual function, everything. They create obese, more weight on the belly, because it's all related to mental stress. It creates physiologic stress. But that also has the reverse. Physiologic and physical stress can create mental stress. How? If I have pain all the time, yeah. if I have this chronic pain, it affects my ability to sleep. It affects my ability to think properly. It makes me moody and irritable, right? It makes me kind of angry or just bitter in some regards too because why? People ask that why. So it can affect people's stress, you know? Like it, 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 it can make people stressed out mentally. And so I, you know, when I was telling you about the four pillars of health and health, I don't know if I mentioned all of that because I talked about nutrition. Mm -hmm. I talked about hormone balance. I talk I'm good about, at a good exercise routine program for proper health, and because we talked about the days, and should, how many days a week you should do that, and it's more days than not, <laughs> so it should be like closer to six days a week, and then um, a um, good sleep recovery program, right? And a sleep recovery program, you know, like we said, we're talking about seven and a half hours of good sleep. You know, when I was a child, there was a doctor and a nurse. That was it. Yeah. And now you've got. NPs and you've got PAs. That's something. Is that relatively new, or is it just something that uh, is new to me? It's new to you. Okay. They've been around for a long time, and you know it's just scope of practice. And then that's obviously changed over time, too. And I think many states have different scopes of practice and how they need to be supervised. Uh, California, more recently, I think they passed uh, some recent um, laws to uh, let nurse practitioners' scope of practice not to be determined, and therefore they may not require supervision anymore. Um, and I think that's on the books. It doesn't go into effect for another year, maybe two. Uh, I don't get a nurse practitioner. I don't know this, but you know those things may be challenged because it's not we don't, like we don't have enough physicians um, available. And I think that um, I think a lot of people have different views. Uh, I think nurse practitioners are great. Um, I think that they're easy to teach. Um, again, there's a different perspective in terms of how much education you get on both sides. And uh, obviously, if you're a physician, there's this rites of passage. Um, you know, um, thought process where, you know, we all had to suffer, why don't they suffer, you know? Because you had to sit up, stand, and if you have 38 hours before you go home and pass out, you know, and be back doing it all again, call like three days later. I mean, those were suffering times. I think it probably did more damage than good for most, most physicians because I don't know how much, you know, effective medicine you actually learned and were able to execute as an intern suffering like that. Again, you were supervised by a senior resident and then a chief resident and then attending, but you know, when you're running on fumes all night, you don't really know what you do, you're just being told what to do and you just do it. I don't know if that's the most effective way of treating, of, of teaching anybody. And so, um, I, I, I just don't think it is. I never thought I was, uh, I was never a big fan of it. But at the same time, I recognize having volume teaches too. Now, how much education is required to be a PA, a physician's assistant? Well, uh, most PAs, uh, now I don't know if things have changed over time. Again, back when I was training, when I was beca becoming a physician, uh, PAs required two years of, um, of training. I don't know if, what prerequisites they required to get into the physician assistant programs. Uh, obviously, if you're in a nurse practitioner program, you had to get a nursing degree, mm -hmm. okay? And then you had to go and do your NP, and then a lot of NPs do also their masters, uh, so they do some research. and. So it just depends. The, obviously, the level of training is different, is different, but I always, you know, a nurse practitioner, think of it this way, is they can come in, you can teach them a lot of stuff, and they can do a lot of stuff under the scope of practice because they have their own license, DEA, all this stuff. PAs operate within, within a scope of practice. Okay. And so you delineate that scope, you kind of write it out, they agree to it, it's kind of in your books in the office, and but they require more supervision because you need to basically check out every patient every day. That okay. makes sense. So now, what is a medical assistant allowed to do? Medical assistants can do whatever you teach them to do. Um, they're not. They're not. You know, they're in the scope of. You know, um, they get trained to do. You know, vital signs and take weight measurements, measure height, uh, do body mass indexes. Um, they are also trained to do uh, deliver injections if they feel comfortable. They can be shown how to draw blood. They can be shown how to hook up EKG machines, how to do a pulmonary function test. They just have to demonstrate um, the efficiency and the ability to do so. And within that clinical scope of practice of that, of that clinician's office, they may feel very comfortable with having their medical assistant do those things. Uh, but it's really 
determined by the scope of practice within a physician of what they feel like the medical assistant can do. But for the most part, I'm, and I use mine for those things, I also do them for prepping, like for treatments, like laser treatments, or prepping for IV treatments. I put the IVs in myself, I do all my lays, I do all my um, injectables and things like that, except for like maybe vitamin injections, and they've been taught how to do this. So they're very good at that. I wouldn't let anybody do it. Obviously our practice is very different. I can't say that the same thing happens to most other medical practices. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I have to admire your, your staff and, and yourself dealing with some of the things that I certainly <laughs> would run from the room screaming about. Yeah, you know, I think that the trick to being uh, a physician, a clinician in any fashion is that you disconnect yourself from the subjective emotional part of it, it becomes an objective part. I need to do this, this is going to help me figure out what I'm doing, and this patient needs this. And so I think when you disconnect yourself from the emotional part of it and subjective, it makes it very easy. It, it's just a matter of being trained how to do that. And the other problem is that once you, some people don't know how to stop that. So when they walk through the room, they never develop a relationship where a patient feels they trust them. Ah. And because they're not able to be real, they don't communicate all the information that's going on. I can't figure anything out for somebody they don't, unless they tell me everything that's going on. And I, and I always had a conversation, tell me everything. If you tell me everything, no matter what it is, I can help you probably. You know, but if you don't tell me, I'll never know. And a patient's more likely not to um, tell you everything that's going on or have a really trusting or you know, relationship where they feel they can give you all and tell you things that they couldn't share with anybody else. Why? Because when you walk in the room, you never sit down, you stand up, you just go, uh-huh, 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 and you write out and you give your, and, well, what are they gonna, how are they going to feel that relationship is? They're not going to feel very good about that relationship. That, it, that happens all the time. And that was one of the things that uh, our friend, Tracy Tappan, who recommended you to me, one of the first things she said, she goes, he sits down with you and he talks to you and he writes things down. Yeah. Oh, wow. Unheard of, you know. One would argue that makes me less efficient. <laughs> so, um, but more human. More human. I think that we could probably, you know, uh, do things in a way where patients feel more inclusive of what's going on in the room. Like I could sit there and talk and say, oh yeah, and then the conversation, and then type some stuff in and go, and then go back to the information, or maybe do the full physical exam, talk the whole time, and then write some stuff out or type some stuff out. I don't think it needs to be too complex. Um, but again, I, people have different styles. I think my, I try to adapt my style to the type of patient I'm with. And yeah. I think that we all should try to do that. Well, you seem to have quite a fan club because most of the other patients of yours that I've met seem very happy oh, with you. Oh, I appreciate that. I, I, you know, I, I love what I do and, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it as long as I can because uh, I don't, can't mis imagine myself doing anything else or let alone retiring ever. That seems absurd, but... You know, if you get a lot of satisfaction in life at helping people and fixing the problems, and then, you know, every once in a while you see them by and they, and, and they recognize you and they say, thank you very much, it's good to see you. And it's like, oh, it makes you feel good, you know? Absolutely. Right, as clinicians, we don't hear that enough. And so when you, you, you know, you, you toot my heart a little bit here, it makes you feel good because you probably don't hear that enough. <laughs> so. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you again. I always enjoy this.